I'm sorry, the link got changed, um, but it's... I'm sorry, the link got changed, um, but it's... I'm sorry, the link got changed, um, but it's... So you're lying. I'm sorry, on. the link got changed. So you're lying. I'm sorry, the link got changed. Yeah, we are live on YouTube. Should I unmute? Well, thank you um, all for being here tonight. My name is Farhan Oshin. I'm the co-founder of this year, a nonprofit social justice arts organization. We had some te technical difficulties, so hopefully um, people will find themselves back here. So this year's mission is to inspire social change through film, arts and storytelling. And um, so welcome to our Tasvir's Pride Month programming titled Kal Aaj or Kal, mm -hmm. meaning yesterday, today, and tomorrow. As they see queer folk, we remember our history, we reflect on the present moment, and we ask ourselves, how do we want to move forward? So every Tuesday in the month of June, we have a program exploring this theme, and you can find information on our website at thisvee.org. So tonight, we're celebrating a very special filmmaker with a very special classic film, I Am. It is its 10th anniversary, this Pride. Um, please ask your questions on the YouTube chat. Um, and I also want to thank Sonali today for curating the program for this month with me. Um, I want to also thank the Sphere staff, Rita, Hanal, Sunny, Ariel, and Namrita for all the support provided in putting this programming together. So now it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Sonali.
Okay. This is Sonali. Hi. Hi, Sonali. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Wonderful thing. Um, I want to also thank Chris. So thank you for screening. I am again. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a way for us to uh, perhaps share the, the new link. The link or? Well, the, you know, the, the link to this q and is changed from the screening and I'm not sure if everybody got it. Well, this is, this is, you know, when we talk about Kal, Aj or Kal, <laughs> this is so our Aj. <laughs> so I think this is a situation we're in. We're having pride on Zoom right now and trying to navigate all these uh, techni technology, all this technology. And it's, uh, it's just really reflective of um, the work that we're doing and how things have changed. Uh, you and I would have been on a stage somewhere in a theater and uh, across from each other, we would have been speaking in person and seeing the entire audience. <laughs> but right now I see my window. So here we are, Sonali, after so many years. Um, so I say we just start talking and just enjoy our conversation and hope for the best. So um, let's start out um, by talking about, um, about how, how you have been screening films with us with the Sphere since 2002 and I actually met you in 1999 at Days for Days with your film, Some Total There. And it's just been a really long journey of you exploring um, your identity and who you are. And you can say who I am, the theme of I am uh, through this tool of film. And I see that um, Film has been an amazing tool for the South Asian LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, we have just the genre that we come up with. It's amazing. It blows my mind, and it's pro it's my favorite genre as a and not and definitely as a queer South Asian, but I think also it as film. We we just make amazing film, and um, I wanted to know how you came came to film and how it became a tool for your identity exploration. So I guess uh, I've been, you know, my interest in filmmaking really began when I started watching ethnographic films. And I noticed that there were a lot of films being made by cis white, I mean, uh, uh, cis male white men who had the resources to travel to various parts of the world and represent quote unquote the other. And I really began to ask this question of self-representation, like who, who gets the power to represent whom and who gets to tell whose story. And um, it became really important to me, this idea that we need to tell our own stories if we want uh, ourselves to be represented accurately. And, and so I think for me, you know, my journey began with some total, which I think you're screening on June 29th. And that really was putting the camera, facing the camera towards myself. And, uh, and so I think this idea of telling stories uh, and, and some total is one of those films that is sort of very accessible, uh, in terms of, you know, it's it's a poem and it's uh, got text and it's got images and uh, it's, you know, film is one of those mediums where uh, 
people who don't know how to read and write can access it. And so there's a way in which I find it a very universal medium, but I think it's uh, my, that's sort of my interest began with this, my journey into filmmaking really began through anthropology. Yep, and also when I saw some total, it, it didn't seem to me like you were telling your story, you were also telling my story. So I felt very represented. Um, and thinking about it now, that, that was 20 years ago almost. And thinking about it, it was expressing, you know, intersectionality. It was already putting these very complex kind of um, concepts and bringing them together in this four minutes. And then what, what happened after Sum Total? How did you go from Sum Total to I Am and other films along the way? Yeah, so I think, you know, I made some total without having any formal training in film. And I, uh, I was just volunteering for an organization called the History Project in Boston that documents uh, underrepresented histories of people. And it was a borrowed high eight camera. I don't even know if people know what a high eight camera is at this point. Um, and then I decided when, when I made some total and I, it was really, I, I had thought the only person who's going to see it is me and maybe my therapist. And that's about it. I had no intention of really sharing it with people. It was a very sort of diary-esque piece that I had created. And I wasn't even really out at that point. And I was, uh, I made the film and I only used my first name and screened it um, at a, a festival in Boston. And then it took a life of its own and it started screening at other festivals and people were emailing me and I was mailing out VHS tapes for screening the film. And uh, Farah, you and I met in at Desh Pardesh in Toronto, which was my first real sort of screening um, outside of Boston. And uh, and I think that it was that moment where I decided, okay, I want to go to film school and learn the art and craft of storytelling in a more formal way. I want to learn that language. I want to know what the tools are. And so I attended uh, Temple University and went to graduate school there and learned filmmaking. And that's where I sort of picked up the 16 millimeter camera. I made a film called Bare Feet. Uh, and some of these films are on my website. You can access them. Uh, I made a film called Where Is Their Room? Uh, I made a film called uh, Name I Call Myself. And these were films really, a lot of them about my mother because my mother died um, shortly after I graduated from college, a year after I graduated from college. And it was a, a really hard time for me. I was sort of grieving this loss and trying to process it. And it was a very sudden death. My mother was murdered. And so dealing with homicide was very hard. and and so I started making these short films and, and I remember a professor in film school asked, if you had unlimited money, a budget, what film would you make? And I thought, wow, if I, if I had a dream project, if I could make any film I wanted to, I, I would love to make a film about parents of LGBTQ families, because for me, there was this unfinished business of not coming out to my mother that I needed to somehow complete and I started having conversations with parents of other queer people, conversations that I didn't have with my own mother, I had with other parents. And so, um, so that's sort of where I landed up with I Am and I started in 2004 in terms of research and it took me seven years to finish making the film. Thank you. And then when you started making the film, so were you going back and forth to India or how, and so you're making several trips and then you were, so, so your film saw the decriminalizing and um, of three, 377 then. So would you like to talk a little bit about that? Because when you first started, so, so much changed in seven years with our theme of time and change. How was it when you began to the end of, of it? And is that where the film stops? Um, it seemed like that's when the film ended and then the editing began. 
would you say? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, when I first started making the film, Section 377 was very much in place. And I felt really protective of the participants in my film because I felt like I was putting them at risk and I wasn't sure of how much of their identities I was going to reveal, whether they were going to be blurred out, whether I was going to change their voices. Uh, and so I was just shooting and thinking really not so much about, um, you know, the fact that one would really see these people. And, uh, and I was thinking in my mind about, I was actually doing research about what are the ways in which I can protect people's identities. And there were some parents who were like, we don't care, even if Section 377 is in place. Uh, in fact, Piali's mother was the first person to agree to be in the film. She was the first interview I did. And uh, along the way, Harpreet's mother was one of the interviews I did. And um, if you notice in the film, I asked her a question about, you know, what would you say if I, if I told you that I want to come out to my mother and what would you say to my mother? And she kind of tells me this moment where they, she says, you know, I would come to your mother and tell her and like talk to her. And I was just, it was, I had a real sort of real breakdown behind the camera. I'm just sort of bawling. And I, I think at that point I realized I couldn't make this film. I wasn't ready to make the film. I wasn't emotionally like ready to sort of tackle this. And I took a year and a half off. I just was like, okay, I need to wait. I'm not so sure I can make this film yet. And then a year and a half later, I went back and said, all right, I'm, I'm feeling like I can do this and continued those conversations, met more people through word of mouth, through emails. Uh, someone was introducing me to somebody else who was introducing me to somebody else. And in fact, I had a lot more people who were willing to be in the film than I expected um, initially. And so, uh, so yes, it was, it was in terms of time, this, this idea of Aaj, Kal, Aaj, it really sort of is in my film in terms of when I started the film uh, and I was edit, I was, I had an editor, Anupama Chandra, who was editing. And then I, while she was editing, I went back and shot some more because I realized there were pieces that were still needed in the film to really make it cohesive. And, um, and so, oh, it did, you know, and, and I, yes, I was, I happened to be in Delhi when uh, Section 377 was struck down for the first time. Um, and it was this sort of really ironic moment because I was standing there and there was a BBC reporter and I thought there's this colonial British like relic that has just been expunged. And here is this BBC reporter reporting it. And it, it just felt so poignant to have that a British reporter reporting about this law being struck, this British law being struck down that I, and I kept, you know, he kept saying the lines, he was repeating it, he would say it, and then he would say, okay, one more take. And he, it was like, he said it five times, and I have a recording of him saying it five times, and I really wanted it to be in the film like five times, but, you know, editing requires, my, my editor was like, one time. And so, so it was nice but to have that to be to be I was felt really fortunate to be there at that moment I mean I, I, I haven't been there for other moments like when the Supreme Court uh, when, when, it, when it was put back into place and then struck down again by the Supreme Court and I wasn't there for that but my my sister was one of the seven um, people who filed the petition in the Supreme Court uh, when it was struck down in um, 2019, I think it was, right? No, 2009, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 2009. <laughs> and then when did when were you on the television, the show? Which yeah. Was yeah. A great scene. <laughs> yeah, I, I had such um, hesitation about being on television. You know, I was in India in 2008. Mm -hmm. I was helping organize uh, the first Pride March in Delhi and um hang on one second so i uh i was in i was helping organize the first pride march and there was a reporter who asked if i would be willing to 
uh, be on this show called Salam Zindagi. And I said, no, it would be better if you got people who sort of live in India and as opposed to me, who's kind of have my roots in the US and some ways. And uh, I felt like a transplant and and I try. I called a number of my friends and asked if they'd be willing to be in it. And then none of them wanted to be on this show. And and I agreed. And I thought it was so bizarre when they 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 kept telling me they're like, we can find so many gay men, but we can't find a lesbian. We need we just need a lesbian. And I was like, okay. And so I I remember being on this show and they the way they talked about me, like you know, I looked like any other woman. Like I don't have three heads or five noses or you know six eyes and so there was this way in way and they when they came to my house to film me for the b-roll they were like okay we want you to go into this room and then open the door and like just come out like do this performance space and I was like I'm not doing that and so there was this sort of interesting way and they, they told me oh the couch on our show is the same exact couch as Oprah Winfrey as the Oprah show and that was like supposed to draw me into this, to come to this, uh, to participate. And so anyway, I went ahead and did it, but in, I had a lot of reservations. And in some ways, I'm really glad because, you know, months later, I remember I was in a flight going to Bangalore and I was fast asleep. I was probably drooling for all you know, and or snoring, I don't know. But um, an air hostess came up and tapped me on my knees. She was bent down in the middle in the in the passageway and she tapped me on my knee and I woke up and I was like yeah and she's like are you the same woman who was in Salam Zindagi and I said yeah and she said you know I want you to know that my sister uh, saw your show and her mangni which is engagement had already been done to a straight guy and she called me and said that she saw the show on a Thursday evening and the rerun was happening on Sunday and she wanted me to walk turn on the TV and watch the rerun and uh, I and she and I watched it and after the show she called me and said I'm just like that woman and I need you to help me break off my engagement and I heard this story and I thought wow like here I was debating whether I wanted to be on this TV show and here is like I affected somebody's life as a result of being on on TV and and, you know, it was just like one person, but still like the fact that for this idea of representation and of like having a public face and and realizing that I have that privilege of being out and that I'm not going to lose my job and I'm not going to be asked by my landlord or landlady or whatever, like the my like as a tenant, I'm not going to get kicked out from my house. And so I realized like how privileged I was and that, you know, I have a voice and there's so many people who who cannot come out. They're people who are closeted for many, many reasons. And so I felt like it was a res- it, it's a responsibility sometimes to like use that privilege to say, okay, I can be out and I ought to speak for those who can't. Well, you know, you, it wasn't, it's not just one person. That's just one person that you know about. There's so many that are impacted that you may not know about that we don't know about so that definitely it makes a very big difference it also makes a difference in you know chipping away at heteronormativity um it, and it, it makes a difference in the future if you do that now you don't know how that'll affect maybe a parent has heard something and then you know, five years later, their child comes out to them, they'll remember that. So it's definitely a rippling effect. Okay, let me see if I have questions or we have some questions on here. Uh, One is, uh, what was the most gratifying part of making I Am? And what was uh, the most difficult? And this is from Ariel. I mean, I think the most challenging part of making I Am was, of course, you know, living in the U.S. and telling stories about people who are living in India and traveling back and forth and not sort of being there throughout, you know, and tell and that therefore like telling it over a long period of time, which in some ways was a good way because good 
way to get to know people, to establish trust, to build a relationship. Um, but it was also like really exhausting to be, everybody would be like, hey, so when is your film coming out? And I'd be like, oh, I'm still working on it. And so I would prefer not to spend seven years making a film. So that was definitely hard. I think the gratifying part is like seeing people say that it's affected, it's changed something in their life, whether it's watching it or having their parents watch it, um, you know, and, and speaking of parents, I do want to give a shout out to parents who watched the film this evening with their children, with their LGBTQ children, because I know there are a few of them out there. And so I just want to give a shout out to say thank you for doing that. And thank you for being there with your child. And, and I, I, I know what that I know how amazing that feels. When we have a few more questions. Um, is there one thing which you wish you could go back and edit and update and do it just a little differently if you were able to? Yeah, oh my gosh, I, there's so much I wish I could change at this point. You know, I feel that um, for me, uh, including Dalit voices is very important. Um, it's uh, thinking about class diversity is really important. Uh, thinking about religious beliefs, you know, um, I wish the film were much more diverse in terms of class, religion, um, caste, um, and even region. Like there's, there's hardly, there's nobody represented from South India, for instance. And so uh, if I could go back, I would really make a conscious effort to make sure that I'm including voices that need to be heard and with like there are there are there is sort of um, that intersectionality within our community is missing for me in this film, and I wish I could go back and um, and be much more much more careful in terms of whose voices I'm including. Well, taking that in a like a stepping back and kind of looking at that, do you feel that the films or the literature or like how has that changed today? And do you feel that was it was at a particular time? So it's not so much about a mistake that you had made, or was it was that discourse, that conversation in our community, in our LGBTQ community, to talk about inclusivity, um, especially with class and cast, do you feel at that time there was that conversation? Sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, I think that I was definitely conscious of things while I was making the film. So for example, I noticed that, you know, there was so many butch women represented in the film and, and um, Ritu Barna was like the solitary femme. And so there were things in which, I, there were ways in which I was conscious of like how people are being represented and who's being represented and who's not being represented. Um, but, you know, it was, it was I think this, it's a huge burden when you're the only one making a project like this. Uh, and since then there have been many, uh, the, since I've been, you know, making films since 1999 now, there are so many more films about South Asian queers, South Asian queer filmmakers of, of South Asian queer films. And so, and I think the more people speak up and more representation is there, there's, there that kind of diversity sort of comes through. And I'm much more conscious of it doing work now, thinking about like, what are the kinds of films I wanna make and whose voices are being represented. Um, and so I think in terms of like aaj kal aaj, like, or yeah, kal kal aaj, kal, uh, I, I am definitely in that place where I'm much more conscious and much more um, critical of, uh, of media and watching films. And, you know, I recently watched a film about a Dalit lesbian and was like, I thought, wow, this is really impressive that we are hearing Dalit voices. And yet I was like, it's 
still very problematic in the ways in which people are represented. And here is this Dalit lesbian being represented in this way where she comes across as somebody who's manipulative or very calculating and getting this job from another, this person. Like there's a way in which, you know, and, and, and so while I can appreciate things like, oh my gosh, this is amazing that we're hearing, we're seeing a Dalit lesbian on screen, there are ways in which I can also be critical and say, yeah, but it's not really as, as well as, as accurately or as well as one would hope and wish for these kinds of representations. And so, and I think I bring that critique to my own work too. I look at my own work critically, my work from the past, my work from the present. And, I, and you know, it, it's just, I guess, part of growing as an artist is to really sort of look at our own work and see what are the ways in which we can do better. We have a story from Erica thanking you for the film. And she writes, first, I want to thank you for making and sharing I Am. I came out in college at MHSC and have identified as bisexual for the last 30 plus years. Flash forward, I'm married to a man now and I have an 11 year old daughter who, who just came out to me as pansexual. Your film has helped me in so many ways and has touched me. I was crying happy tears at the end and I can't wait to share this film with my daughter. Thank you, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Yay. And I think that's this Mount Holyoke alum. That's MHC okay. is Mount Holyoke College, which is <laughs> okay. where I came out to myself. And so, um, yes, Mount Holyoke. Oh. And maybe you know, is she a friend? No, I don't know Erica, but I, I don't think I do. Uh, uh, or maybe, maybe I do. I don't know. I'm not. I, I, Erica is a pretty common name, and so maybe. Um, but that's amazing that, you know, like the ways in which we, um, um, this issue of like sexuality sort of comes around in this way that we don't expect it. Like we, you know, I, I have a, a nine-year-old child myself and I think about that a lot. I think about like being, a, being a conscious, um, feminist parent where I'm teaching my child to uh, ask for consent before uh, touching anybody or um, making like my my child at the age of four was asking people that he would meet like do you go by he she or they you know like asking people's gender pronouns and um, and so there are ways in which I think um, I never, I never thought, I never, you know, when I was making I Am, I never thought that there will be a time that I would be having these kinds of experiences in my life and that I would be re-experiencing coming out as a parent, you know, like people assume that since I'm a mother and I'm a single mother and I have a child, people assume that I'm straight. And so there's, I'm finding myself coming out um, in, in a different way. Um, so anyway. But thank you, Erica, for that note. Yeah, and also uh, another thing in Erica's question or story sharing is this uh, bisexuality and pansexuality, which was, I think, a more difficult probably to have in film around that time. So that's another way of uh, being intersectional and inclusive. And we have two people asking the same question, Lee and Erica again, that have you kept in touch and followed up with the wonderful folks you met and shared with? And can you give an update of where these people are today? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I've actually kept in touch with every single person who's in the film. And in fact, I remember uh, Aditya's mother, Kanta Advani, who I went to visit once uh, a few years ago. And she was like, wait, why are you coming to see me? We were done with the film. And I'm like, yeah, but I, 
feel this sort of connection with you and i went you know i was in delhi and i wanted to see you so and, and she was like oh, okay and but people like rushan like are now part of my extended family and you know he's come and stayed with me over thanksgiving and he's um you know i i consider him as part of my family i consider leslie as part of my family i've kept in touch with piali for all these years uh, nick hill um and samir i just uh, uh, chatted with him yesterday um and i guess in terms of where they are now um uh, i you know lakshi in my film transition to roshan bali in the film transition to samir um and there've been some losses along the way you know piali's mother passed away uh, aditya's mother passed away um harpreet's aunts both of them passed away the second aunt passed away just a few weeks ago uh, and so there've been some losses nikhil's father passed away um and so there've been losses along the way um since this film is may has been made and so in some ways it also documents the lives of those who have passed um and so yeah i've kept in touch with them and i'm uh and this film has sort of helped me find an extended family for myself and i'm really grateful for that and you found people to participate through this word of mouth and were there organized groups that you turned to this is lee's question was did you turn to organized groups um or yeah how did that come about of finding them yeah i uh i created a this is pre facebook talk about kal <laughs> um on yahoo groups i created a group called desi dikes in 1998 and it was a group of south asian uh queer lesbian bisexual women who were lived all over the globe pretty much they were like uh you know started out with like six people and i think it grew to like 300 rather quickly and and kept growing and and now they see dikes exists on facebook uh, not as active but that was one of the places there used to be another group called kush list which was for everybody and i in terms of lgbtq um and it wasn't just women only and so uh so that was another place where i through which i reached out because uh, it was a global group there were south asians all over and and so you know when i made the film piali was living in the us and still is and piali's mother was in delhi and i made the film and nikhil with was the same living in the us and his mother was in his family was in india and i filmed his family living in bombay and so there are ways in which um i connected with people here and met their families in india and then i met people who were living in india whose families were in india and i think also for me i should say is what was really important was i wanted to make sure that queer people's voices were heard like it wasn't just parents talking about their children and speaking for somebody else i wanted queer people to speak for themselves and have their own voices heard and not just have their parents talking about them there's many questions still um in the queue here i want to let people know right now about next week um screening called i am bani and it really speaks to the diversity of uh, voices that we want represented and this is about someone who um was intersex and transgender uh as well as you know live, have li has lived in poverty as well so we would love uh for you to join us uh we're creating a very interesting kind of post uh film discussion by inviting anyone who identifies as transgender or um or an ally to join in on the conversation so you can ask your own questions right within our um zoom meeting so that will be next week on the 15th then and we're also working on a palestinian solidarity uh 
program for the 22nd. And then the 29th, I'm going to let Sonali talk about that a little bit because that will be a um, program that she's been really working on curating. Yeah, so, that, so on June 29th, we're having this um, community gathering sort of a discussion uh, for uh, queer, um, lesbian, bisexual, trans women to talk about um, this idea of where we've been uh, in terms of queer organizing and, you know, really sort of taking this idea of uh, kal, aaj kal, which is yesterday, today, tomorrow, and thinking, talking about, you know, what we've done in the past that has helped in terms of our organizing for our community, really getting a sense of, it's really an intergenerational dialogue, really, between, uh, to talk about what has worked in the past, where we are now, and what can we do going, moving forward. We hope to see you come back um, throughout this month. It'll be wonderful to have everybody back. Um, I'll go through a few more of these questions. We are running a bit out of time, so we'll go through them. Um, what would you say about representation of homosexuality in mainstream, mainstream cinema, such as Bollywood? If you watch Bollywood. <laughs> if I watch Bollywood. I mean, I think it's definitely absent in many ways and, and is problematic in its representation historically, you know, in terms of how queer people have been represented and made fun of in very sort of stereotypical ways where we've seen Anupam Kher be extremely effeminate and, um, and or being, or, or if gay people are being, or, or pretending to be gay, or, you know, there are these ways in which it's talked about, but in a in a sort of a very negative way. Um, though I'm hoping that things will change, of course, you know, I mean, there is a little bit of a shift in seeing at least one or two new um, new films that have come out from Bol in out of Bollywood that are addressing uh, the subject of sexuality, um, which deviates from, you know, Quote, heteronormativity and 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 uh, which doesn't sort of reinforce heteronormativity and and is talking about um, homosexuality specifically, um, but I think uh, really I feel like the people who 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 push the boundaries are the independent filmmakers and people from the periphery who are making those sort of um, asking people for that change and I think. I don't know. I, I, there, there is at this point, I'm not able to hold up one Bollywood film and be like, "Oh my God, this is it!" Like I love it, and this is how we. I would love for us to be represented. So I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully we'll we'll get there. Okay, we have um, we have another comment from a former student from VCU, 2015. Appreciation comment from Victoria Sharp, former student. Thank you so much for screening this tonight. Seeing this in your class was really formative for me. Someone who really didn't know uh, who they were yet. I've been thinking about this film for the past few months and the turmoil of coming out to my family as queer who weren't receptive to me coming out as Ace and Demi in 2012. I'm still not sure if I ever will, but it's cathartic to re-see all these stories. Thank you so much, Sonali. I hope you and your family are well. And we have another question from, uh, another appreciative comment from Diana. I am so appreciative of the chance to see this film. Thank you. So now, and then what is next for you in filmmaking? Thank you for those comments. Um, I think it's really reaffirming to hear them in the sense that, um, you know, as filmmakers, we, we, we write grant proposals and, and we submit films to film festivals and we get a lot of rejections. And so, 
when we hear these kinds of voices, they really sort of counter that, I, that I've written like six grant proposals and haven't gotten even one so far. I probably shouldn't be saying, sharing this publicly, but I am. Uh, and so it's really reaffirming to hear this, um, that, that doing this work is important. Uh, for me, the next project, I have a couple of different projects um, that are in the works. One is uh, a feature length fiction film for which I've written the script and I'm now going to be going to various labs, hopefully uh, with it to workshop it and to um, help it get to the next stage of um, finding a producer and getting it off the ground. I've never really dabbled into fiction filmmaking and I've always been curious and I feel like I need to just do it once because I, uh, and I don't know if I'll do it again, but I, I feel like I, I, it's something I want to dip my feet into. Uh, but I've always loved the short form and I've loved making short films and I've, uh, I've just finished making one short film called Miles and Kilometers, which will be premiering this year. And uh, it's just two minutes long, but it'll it'll be out very, very soon. And um, look out for it. Uh, and then I have another film that I'm making, which is an animated film. It's an animated documentary on, um, uh, and it's called Occupy. And it's about ocup occupying public space. And it's about gender and sexuality and about how we appear and, and how we, how, what people assume that we are, how we, you know, public spaces like, like bathrooms and airports and, and this idea and, and this basically about gender and sexuality in public spaces. Great. Well, this is the perfect time to also plug in uh, about our film fund. So the Sphere has a film fund for $5,000 towards the production of a LGBTQ themed film. So there's information on our website at thesphere.org. So we will uh, give $5,000 towards anything that you would uh, like to make. So if those of you who are listening, just take that as note. It can go towards a bigger project or it can be a short film. Okay, and we have a few more things. Um, Rita would, there was one from Summer first. It was about, I don't know if you have this information, how would you describe the nature of homosexuality in countries such as Sim Singapore, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, which are the top industrialized Asian countries? I honestly don't have an answer to that. I, I don't know much about what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, uh, as, and it's specifically like East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and so I'm not able to answer that one. I, I can just speak to Jeff, the Japan and anime because my son, he loves to watch anime and there's actually a genre of queer anime. There is so much out there on that. So that's about all we know. <laughs> so it would be a good thing to research. And then Rita would like to know, uh, and this may be a good place to close out, is um, can you tell a little bit more about not being able to come out with your mom? Um, and, what your, and what your aunt said, has it been helping? So uh, why do you feel you had not come out? Well, you know, I thought about coming out to my mother and I tested the waters. I uh, told my mother about uh, another friend of mine who's a lesbian and I said, so-and-so is a lesbian. And she said, oh, she needs to go see a psychiatrist. And that made me realize that my mother was not going to be okay about me coming out. And ironically, I was dating a psychiatrist years later after my mother passed away and I thought, Oh, I should tell my mother I'm seeing a psychiatrist, you know, like seeing a psychiatrist. Um, but I, so I didn't come out to her because I, I think I, ha I had a sense that she would not be okay. And it was, I feared coming out to her because I feared rejection. And 
I feared that my mother would um, stop talking to me or disown me or, um, and I think wanting our parents to accept us is really sort of primal in many ways. I noticed that even in my own child, like, you know, when he was first, the first time he stood up, he like, I got so excited and I clapped and he expected that right after that, the next time he stood up, he, you know, he was just learning to stand and he like, I didn't clap and he started clapping and he fell right down because he lost his balance. And I noticed, oh my gosh, this, this need for like wanting our parents to like accept and, and like, and appreciate what we can do is really important to us. And, and I, I think I, uh, I also feel like my mother may have had some sense of uh, like the thought crossed her mind for sure that I could be a lesbian because she asked one of my friends during graduation, like, does Sonali have a boyfriend? And then 10 minutes later, she said, does she have a girlfriend? And my friend, you know, didn't really said straight out no to the boyfriend part and didn't quite give a a firm like an answer for the girlfriend part and so just the fact that it crossed my mother's mind makes me want makes me think that okay so she it it did it did occur to her to even ask that question and so I I I think it it feels it still feels unfinished in many ways to me this idea of not having come out to my own mother um though I've come out to my child like I've explained to him my, my child is like um I came out to him when he was very very young and like explaining to him like who I was and and he's constantly outing me all the time like a uh, in London and we were in a taxi ride and the taxi driver said so where's your husband and my little kid was like oh my mother's a lesbian she doesn't have a husband you know <laughs> like really like and I was like oh I don't know if I would have really come out with this random taxi driver <laughs> I don't know how safe it is to come out and so but here we are queer out here <laughs> okay I think I think we can start to close we can close is there any last words um I love I just want to hmm? I just want to say thank you for organizing this and you know um, I didn't realize the 10 year anniversary for this film like crept up on me. I was just like, wait, it's been 10 years since I made this, since this film came out. And so thank you for screening it and marking this 10th birthday of this film. And um, it feels like I'm sort of coming back home because I, you know, the sphere started out with screening my films, like the first public screening of the sphere was with some total and like, it feels kind of full circle to be coming back and showing this film after 10 years. And so thank you for this opportunity. And um, I really appreciate this, this moment of being able to talk about the film. Yeah, thank you. And I think this uh, Kal Ajur Kal isn't a linear line. It's a circle, <laughs> it just keeps, or a spiral, it keeps going round and round rather than um, going, it's not, a lin you know, linear time is not linear at all. Just thinking that, yes, you, if, if in case somebody didn't catch that, we launched the sphere with some total on Pride in 2002. So next year will be our 20th anniversary and we'll bring you back. <laughs> Maybe with the fiction film, I wanted to make that comment. I would love for you to make a fiction, a, a story. We would love to see that. Okay, so uh, thank you. And it was great to have you. And there are no more questions. And we can close um, to this. Thank you for all that. Thank you for everybody who came to watch the film. Yeah. And it's it's on for the rest of the month if you want to share it with friends. Yep, and so are so is this conversation. It'll be on for the rest of the month. And please go to thesphere.org slash pride-month um, to look at our events. And also we have some um, lists of other films as well as literature and art 
on there. And if you have any suggestions of anything you want on that page, you can email us and let us know. We hope that uh, you join us. So happy Pride 2021. Start with